Oh, it's, it's very nice to be back in Arkansas. Um, this is, uh, I was here two years ago when we had the Southern Historical Association meeting and was here at the, uh, at the Presidential Library, but I got a wonderful tour today. I don't think I was really here two years ago. I missed most of the good stuff, I think. But um, no, it's great to be back. I, I first came here in 1973. I was working on my dissertation, and originally it was going to be a study of southern demagogues. So many demagogues, so little time. You know, I had so many to choose from. <laughs> And I, I, there, there's a wonderful a book by Richard Hofstadter called The American Political Tradition. It has a series of biographical essays, and I, I thought I'd do something like that. But I ended up do, really only doing Arkansas. I sort of got whittled down, and I decided to do more of a micro-study of this wonderful character, Jeff Davis. Uh, I, I titled the book The Wild Ass of the Ozarks. Um, he was also called the Karl Marx of the Hillbillies, the Tribune of Haybinders. There's an endless number of nicknames and a wild and woolly character. And uh, that was really how my career started. So I feel like I've come full circle to come back to back here. I became very, very fond of Arkansas. I was here for six weeks that first time, mostly in Fayetteville, but a lot in Little Rock. And Nick Nikolai interviewed me just a moment ago I guess it's going to be on one of the local NPR stations, and he made me tell this story that I had told him. So it's my first night in Arkansas. I come in on a Sunday night, and um, it was different then than it is now in Little Rock, I would say. There was, the only thing open was dinner time, was the bus station counter. So I thought, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a graduate student. I'm on a low budget. That's perfectly fine with me. You know, I'll get a hamburger. So I went up to the counter and I, I ordered a hamburger. And the, well, the first thing I noticed that in the um, little um, bowls on each table, it had, maybe some of you remember this, there were little sugar packets that said, talk Arkansas up. It's kind of, a, I guess, a campaign to be prideful about Arkansas. So I thought, okay, that's great. And then I, but then I go up to the counter to, to get the hamburger, and it uh, looks pretty good, and I bite into it, and I, I immediately feel metal on my teeth, and there was about an inch and a half or two inch bolt inside the meat, so somehow it gotten in there. So I, fortunately it didn't break my teeth, but I opened the bun, and there's the bolt, so I took it up to the counter, and I pointed out to the man working there that uh, there's a bolt in my hamburger, you know. And he didn't look all that surprised, you know. <laughs> and he, he reached out and he picked the bolt out of the hamburger, took the bun, put it back on, and took, gave it back to me. <laughs> no explanation, no apology. Uh, and to tell you the truth, I think I ate it, you know. <laughs> I thought I was so hungry. <laughs> this is the way they do things in Arkansas. I'm okay with it, you know. But... Um, Anyway, that was not a, maybe an auspicious beginning, but I grew very fond of the state. And in those days, not too many people were writing Arkansas history. And so uh, I became sort of known as someone who knew something about Arkansas among the kind of fraternity of Southern historians. So um, Arthur Ashe, uh, I, I'm, I've been speaking all over the country about Arthur, and I'm never quite sure uh, how much people know about him, particularly when I was speaking to younger audiences. Um, this is a pretty young audience, but I, sometimes I'm speaking to really young audiences, and um, they did, I, in fact, last week I was at UCLA where Arthur went to college, you know, and they moved the Ash, uh, um, what they call it the Arthur Ash legacy now. Uh, it, it was the Arthur Ashe Learning Center and a foundation, and, and so there, his widow, Jeannie, has been a terrible burden on her for the last 25 years, trying to sort of keep things going. And So they moved to the UCLA, and they're actually offering a course on Arthur Ashe in the 20th century. So that was really fabulous. A freshman seminar meets one an hour a week. Well, I've been so busy talking about Arthur since the U.S. Open, since the book came out in August, that there was only one Wednesday this entire fall that I could go, and it was October 3rd 
turns out to be the first day of class. So the freshman seminar, got a picture here. These are freshmen, they've never had a college class of any kind before. And they walk in and there I am, okay? You're talking about this person that most of them had no idea, I think, who he was. In fact, the, the, the health center at UCLA is named for Arthur. And so one of the students looked really puzzled and he said, I, I thought Arthur Ashe was a black doctor. That, why do they name the health center for him, you know? So she had no idea that he even played tennis at all. But it sort of reminded me of the, the last book that I published before this one was in 2009, the year I started work on the book, called The Sound of Freedom. And it's a study of Marian Anderson, the great black contralto. You may remember uh, the, the Daughters of the American Revolution would not allow her to sing in Constitution Hall because she was black. She was already one of the three or four most famous singers in the world. She can return home from Europe after several years. Somehow the DAR didn't get the memo or the, the email <laughs> that she was that famous. They wouldn't let her sing. Eventually, of course, um, they find the only place she can sing is in front of the Lincoln Memorial outside. And 75,000 people show up. It's on, it's on Easter Sunday, 1939. Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, resigned from the DAR in the process. It became one of the first kind of major civil rights milestones where blacks and whites came together to find a place for Marion to sing. So anyway, I had, I had a wonderful time doing that book. It's actually, they just started production of an American Masters on PBS on based on the book, which will be out in two years. I'm excited about that. But so the book has just come out and I'm teaching a seminar and we take a break in the middle, a three hour seminar, and one of my students came up and congratulated me and said, I'm so pleased you finished your book on Marian Anderson. There was another student standing there who said, who is Marian Anderson? Which didn't surprise me. You know, she, Marian died in 1993, the same year that Arthur died. She was 96, however, at the time, and she's not an iconic figure anymore, I realize. So I said, it was the break on the class, so I said, okay, I don't have time to uh, tell you who she really is, just think of her this way. She was the Jackie Robinson of classical music. She looked even more puzzled. You know what happened next, okay? <laughs> she said, who is Jackie Robinson? And I just lost it. I, I'm sorry, I, I just, I go find out, you know. Uh, she was you know, in her mid-20s, she wasn't really a kid and she should have known, but. So anyway, I'm, I guess I'm, we all have uh, holes in our education, and, but I'd like to think that most of us know who Jackie Robinson is and certainly maybe who Arthur Ashe was because uh, I think they were two of the most remarkable figures uh, in, in any walk of life in the United States in the, in the 20th century. Um, I, uh, I got into the Ashe business, you might say, or thinking about it, when I was a graduate student in Boston in the early 70s, I had a very close friend, and the book is dedicated to him and his wife. Uh, he was my best friend in graduate school, his name was Jim Horton. Uh, he was African American from Newark. Um, exactly, he looked like Arthur Ashe's twin. He was six foot one, 155 pounds. Uh, he, he always wore Arthur Ashe clothes, you know, the Catalina sportswear. He, he always carried an Arthur Ashe racket. And uh, he, 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 just, he wrote about Frederick Douglass, but I think Ashe was his greatest, greatest hero. And so all of his other friends, and he was my tennis partner for years, we had to bow down to Arthur Ashe. And in 1972, uh, we were at the U.S. Pro Tournament at Longwood, which is in Chestnut Hill, just west of Boston. And Ash was just about to play Tom Ocker, the Flying Dutchman, who, he, of course, he'd already beaten in the finals of the first U.S. Open in 1968, which we just commemorated the 50th anniversary. So he and Ocker were in the locker room, and so there's Jim. We're all standing there, and Jim looks, looks just like Arthur Ashe, and my, my sister-in-law is a kind of a practical joker. He looks over at Jim and says, Arthur, the top of her lungs. Immediately, 150, 200 people are just all, all over him for autographs. And uh, he didn't miss a beat, he starts signing. Yours truly, James Oliver Horton. And they, they looked at it and, and uh, three or four minutes later, the real Arthur Ashe comes out and watches this imposter signing autographs on the program. And it was, they were all very good natured about it. And I always thought that that was, uh, the highest point in my friend Jim's life when he got to pretend to be Arthur Ashe signing, signing autographs. And sadly, he, um, 
uh, Jim was sort of present at the creation of this book, but uh, uh, contracted this horrible brain condition called a frontal lobe condition, which mimics Alzheimer's, and he died a year and a half ago. He never, he never knew. He didn't know his wife at the end. He didn't know me. He didn't know anyone. And, but um, I, I never would have written the book without him, I would say. That's really so that's why I dedicated, dedicated it to him. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he did inspire me. Uh, the other reason, of course, was uh, I, I've, uh, as uh, Nikolai mentioned, early in my career I studied demagogues, <laughs> sort of the bad guys, I guess you might say, of history, and after doing that for about 20 years, uh, people used to refer to me as the world's only demagographer, you know. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, I, but civil rights history had always been my greatest love, and, and so I wanted to recover some of these heroic stories, really, that uh, somehow never made it into the mainstream press or have somehow been forgotten. And so I've written three books in that genre. The first one was Freedom Riders, uh, which uh, I'm thankful they had an enormous reaction and was made into an American experience film, which some of you may have seen. It won three Emmys, and it's been seen over by 60 million people now. So, you know, you're usually, if you, the average history book sells 600 copies. You're lucky if your mother-in-law buys it or reads it, you know. So the idea that people would know this story all over the world has been very uh, gratifying. And then I did the Marian Anderson book, and then the Arthur Ashe. And I see them all as part of a trilogy of books that recapture parts of the, the broader civil rights struggle that somehow missed, were missed by the historical profession. That no one else had written about these things. I mean, there, were, there, are, there are chapters, and certainly we knew the basic outlines of the story, but no one had taken the time to write an entire book on these, these, these subjects. And I think in part because they tend to be more part of the larger cultural history of civil rights. I think sometimes we think of it as sort of narrowly political. But actually, cultural figures like Arthur Ashe, I think, and uh, and, and, and occasional uh, you know, entertainment figures, um, obviously uh, people like the comedian uh, Dick Gregory, um, Harry Belafonte, maybe is the classic example of someone who had a career as a celebrity, as an entertainer, but actually did a tremendous amount behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the camera for for civil rights. So Arthur was one of those people. I knew that when I started, um, and I, I worried initially that maybe he, because I knew he had this reputation of being such a wonderful person, a paragon of sportsmanship, you know, uh, civility, never raised his voice, never lost his temper, never held a grudge. All those things are true. And I thought, well, maybe he's too flat. I need some creative tension here or something in his life, and, and I found it. I think that, you know, for the first 25 years of his life, you know, he grew up in Jim Crow Richmond, uh, in working class black family. His father, um, I don't wanna tell you too much because I want you to buy and read the book, but I'll tell, I will tell you, the, you probably most of you know this anyway, but when he was four years old, his father got a job running the, the largest black park in Richmond called Brookfield Park. And they also gave him some lumber to build his own house, which he did on, on the park. So they lived all by themselves, about 50 feet from the tennis courts. And then two years later, Arthur's mother died. He was very close to her, very attached to her. And after she died, it was a, it was a pregnancy gone wrong. It was a heart condition. And uh, he withdrew, stopped talking, very forlorn. They were terribly worried about him. He looked like a kind of death camp inmate anyway. He had legs and arms like pipe stems. He only weighed, uh, I know when he played in one tournament when he was 11, he was only 70 pounds then at 11, you can imagine. Uh, anyway, um, there was a man named, of all things, Ron Charity. He was a 19-year-old student at Virginia Union, the historically black college, just up the hill in Richmond from Arthur's house. And he would give lessons on the courts at Brookfield Park, and he saw this pitiful little boy sitting there on the porch. And it took him a while to coax him out to play. 
felt so sorry for him, and eventually he did, but never thinking in a million years that he would really ever become a tennis player. It was just a kind of act of charity. Uh, but Arthur took to it, you know, kind of brought him out of his shell, and they actually taught him how to hit the ball with a kind of slingshot motion. He'd throw his entire body into the, into the shot to even get it over the net. But after a while, he was, you know, beating the other eight-year-olds, and then he was beating the nine-year-olds and the ten-year-olds, and won his first national championship when he was 12. He was the little, little boy who could play tennis. Uh, in fact, uh, when I'm just starting the research for the book in 2009, I'm at a, a launch party for another book, a book on the NAACP by a good friend of mine, Pat Sullivan, and they had this launch party at this wonderful house on Martha's Vineyard. They had a couple hundred people there, and it was really amazing. And there was this African-American woman who was off to the side, and she didn't seem to know anybody. I mean, I didn't know half the people there either, but so I sort of went up and introduced myself uh, to her, and uh, I said, uh, the, 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 it was at the house of Sheldon Hackney, who was my mentor, who later became the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And anyway, um, I said, uh, I'm Sheldon, one of Sheldon's former students, and I'm on my way to Newport to the International Tennis Hall of Fame to do research on a biography of Arthur Ashe. And this is a cocktail party now. She says, well, have I got a story for you? I said, oh, really? You know, I'm not, I didn't think I'm working here. I'm just at a cocktail party. Well, as it turns out, her name was Doris Kamek, and uh, I actually start the book with this story. And at 15, she was one of the most promising young black female tennis players in the country. She wanted to be the next Althea Gibson. Of course, the great Althea Gibson had won, would soon win Wimbledon and the French Open and the U.S. Nationals and the greatest black player before, Serena Williams or Venus Williams. Anyway, uh, so she's 15 years old and she's going to play in this tournament. It's not the U.S. Lawn Tennis Association, which was, of course, Jim Crow, all white. It was the American Tennis Association, the all black kind of Jim Crow equivalent. That's where Arthur first played for, until he was in his mid-teens. Anyway, so she's scheduled to play in this little tournament in Washington, and the, the organizers come out to her and say, Doris, we're so sorry. We, don't, we have an odd number of girls in the draw. There's nobody to play you. However, there's this little boy... Okay. There's this little boy who's, he's, he's, he said he'll play you. And uh, she said, little boy, well, how little is he? Well, they, well he's pretty little. <laughs> but they say he's pretty good. And she says, well, I'm not going to play that baby. So she's telling me the story. And she starts to tear up as she's telling me the story. And she said, uh, uh, but finally I relented. You know, I didn't want to embarrass the little boy. And I figured I'll just make quick work of him. So then when he comes out, and he really is little, she says, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. But finally they convince her, and of course, so they do play, and he destroys her. <laughs> he just destroys her. Uh, he, she hardly won a point in, in two sets, and uh, she told me when it was all over, um, she went to the net to shake his hand, and she had to reach down, you know, over the net. And she was 15, he was 11, you know, and... Uh, but she said he was like the angelic assassin. You look at his face, he was not surprised at all that he beat her. You know, he was just very, very kind of, uh, just, it was just uh, what he did, you know, a little boy who could play tennis. And so that's how the research started with this story about Doris Kamek. Um, and I, I just was so touched by the fact that she kept losing her composure as she was telling me the story, that obviously, and she, oh, I forgot to tell you, she, she quit playing tennis. That was it. She knew she was not going to be the next Althea Gibson. She played a little high school tennis, but she never played again. Uh, she knew. But, but this became, of course, you know, the seminal story in her life. She's been telling it, you know, for years and years and years, never to a historian before. And uh, I was just struck by how emotional she was. She got to know him later, and thought he was the most extraordinary person that she met in her, in her lifetime. And I kept running into that during my interviews. Uh, uh, Cliff Drysdale, some of you are probably familiar with, you know, he's still an announcer today. He's a white South African. He was an anti-apartheid South African and a dear friend of Arthur's. In fact, he was instrumental in getting Arthur to play, be the first black to play against whites in South Africa in 1973 which was a very controversial thing because some of the anti-apartheid people thought that he was being used by the South African government. That they, now they could say, well, see, we're not so bad. We let Arthur Ashe come and play, 
Of course, we, we, we tried to make him on his passport to be an honorary white, you know, which they did to Yvonne Gulagong as well, the great uh, Australian Aboriginal player. But so I'm interviewing Cliff in the, um, the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria in New York. And this is a grand place, and I haven't even started the interview yet. I'm not taping it, I'm just taking notes. Just wanted to get his impressions of what he remembered about Arthur. And he starts crying, starts sobbing. I didn't ask him a question yet, you know, and, and he, he, he apologized and he said, look, I, this always happens to me. Yesterday ESPN came to me and wanted to do an interview with me about Arthur if they were doing a 30 minute little small mini documentary. And I had to say no, because I just can't, I lose it every time. Because I keep thinking about that he's not here anymore. That he died at 49, that he was unquestionably the greatest person that I met in my lifetime. He changed my life. I only wish I could have been more like him. Um, and uh, I mean, he did eventually get his composure uh, and gave me the interview. But I was so struck that he, you know, here's a professional announcer uh, talking about somebody who had been dead for 20 years, um, and yet um, felt so so deeply about it. And this kept happening in the, the many of the 150 interviews that I that I did. They kept saying how he just was different than anybody else they knew. Uh, one of them, Jim Parker, I didn't interview him, but he emailed me after the book came out and was talking about, he knew him in St. Louis in, in their senior year in high school. Believe it or not, Arthur left Richmond to do his senior year in St. Louis because it was relatively racially liberal. This is, of course, the place of Ferguson and Black Lives Matter and, this and all that. And, uh, but it was, uh, he actually got to play indoors against whites. Uh, it, it wasn't cradle to grave segregation, it was pretty segregated, his high school was all black. Um, but, um, but anyway, Jim Parker said, not only did Arthur beat me all the time on the court, Jim Parker was a very fine player himself, but he, he, he had such dignity. I mean, when is the last time you heard of a teenager having dignity? Those two things don't, don't really compute, do they? Uh, but he did. He had this sense of presence, even though he, in those years, he was very shy and reticent and never, you know, spoke out in public uh, until he was, until he was 24 years old. Uh, once he did start to speak, though, and it was in the spring of 1968 when he agreed to speak at a church in Washington, D.C. by the Reverend Jefferson Rogers, who was a close associate of Dr. King's who, who uh, always thought that Arthur's father, who was a strict disciplinarian and kind of conservative, a wonderful man in some respects, but he always told Arthur, stay away from that civil rights mess. Don't get involved. Just keep your eye on the ball, literally and figuratively. But Jefferson Rogers was like a second father to Arthur, and he's always saying, you know, you have a responsibility to the black community. Uh, you, you know, you're, 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 you're known now, you have a platform, people will listen to you, you need to speak your mind. And finally, in March of, of 1968, he goes to the church, this congregational church in Washington, a mixed audience, and who's in the audience but Stokely Carmichael, the, the, the radical SNCC leader. Of course, Arthur's totally intimidated that he's, you know, now he's gonna, his, his debut is gonna be in front of Stokely Carmichael. He meets Stokely and, um, but he gets through it. And, and uh, the next week he comes back to hear Stokely speak. And he never really looked back. And I think part of it was, this, this is March now. Just t t two weeks later, Dr. King is assassinated. And of course, then two months later, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated. They were both two of Arthur's great heroes. And I think they shook him to his core. That he, he, I think maybe another person would have withdrawn even farther into the shell, but he, he went the other way. He took a turn towards activism and he never looked back for the rest of his life. Uh, and I, I had no idea the range of his commitments or how often he was volunteering his time, his money, uh, often not telling anyone, you know. Um, I, I got a, um, telephone call, no, I guess it was an email, uh, about a week after the book came out, uh, 
from a woman named Karen Lucas, who's an attorney in San Francisco. But back in the early 70s, she lived in Oklahoma, and she, she worked for Senator Don Harris. You may remember, um, uh, no, not, 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 what's his first name? Not Don. Don Harris or somebody else. Fred Harris. Fred Harris, who was, called himself a populist. Not a Trump populist, but a real populist, okay? And, and uh, he, he was uh, kind of a liberal guy, and maybe the last liberal politician to come out of Oklahoma, I don't know. But anyway, and his wife was LaDonna Harris, who was a full-blooded Comanche Indian, and she had organized an organization to raise funds for, for um, underprivileged Indian children. Native American children, and they, they just were gearing up to try to ask people for money, and, but out of nowhere, the first check comes in, in the mail, $100, 1972, from Arthur Ashe. They had no idea how he even found out about it, uh, I and mean, this really wasn't his fight, you know, I mean, uh, and, and when she, so Karen sent me this email and saying, you know, I, I always thought, what kind of man was this, you know, who would go out of his way to do this, all the other things he, he was involved in then as the president of the Association of Tennis Professionals and trying to give birth to open tennis and fighting to get to go to South Africa. Uh, and he, but he managed to send them $100, which they didn't cash. They framed it and put it on the wall. LaDonna well, Harris is still going, by the way. She's now in, in New Mexico doing the this, this same kind of uh, charity work. But I keep getting things like that. Uh, uh, these, these, uh, these additional stories that I, of course, I didn't put in the book. The book's long enough, right? Probably too long. Uh, but uh, I wish I could somehow could shoehorn them in, maybe in the paperback. I don't, I'm sure my editor won't let me do that. But, because uh, I had to cut 200 pages out before we published it. Uh, 200 very painful. Uh, my wife helped me enormously uh, to do it. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the Karen Lucas is just one of uh, dozens of stories that, I've, that people have been writing me and calling me. And uh, uh, so uh, there, there was something special about him. You know, I think part of it, uh, this may seem really out of our, our context today, um, he was, civility was what he was all about. He was as good a listener, maybe better than he was a speaker. He was always deliberative. He was a truth seeker and a truth teller. Uh, I mean, he spoke truth to power. He wasn't, he wasn't shy, um, but he never raised his voice. He, he didn't like emotionalism. That's why he was very much opposed uh, to many of the black power advocates, including Stokely Carmichael later, that he thought that it should be rational and uh, try to keep it uh, you know, in terms of the realm of ideas and, and not, not, not emotions. And, uh, and he, he really stuck to that, you know. So that, he was really, I think, happiest when he was testifying before the United Nations, when he was uh, representing Haitian boat people, refugees, as he did. Uh, uh, one of the other stories I begin the book with in, in 1992, he got AIDS in 1983 from a blood transfusion. He had heart condition nearly killed him. And on the, the second surgery in 1983, um, he, he, there, was, there was scar tissue when they cut through for the second operation. And he asked, anything you can do for me to make me recover faster? He still hadn't given up on playing tennis, even, even though he was way past his crime. He, he loved the game like a, like a little kid. Uh, they said, well, we can give you a couple pints of blood. And that's what killed him. He didn't know until 1988 that he, that he had AIDS. Unlike Magic Johnson, he had full-blown AIDS. He didn't have HIV, just HIV. And uh, so he, he, he knows he's not gonna live very long. He, has, he, he, he just told the world in April of 1992, some of you may remember that controversy, USA Today outed him, essentially. They found out, he had told about a dozen people People at the hospital knew, of course, and they all kept the secret for several years. But USA Today found out and they said, we'll give you 24 hours to announce it to the world. He was furious because he had not been, he was not a player anymore. He was an announcer and he did a lot of things in any number of uh, areas, but he thought he was a private person now. And they said, no, you're still a public figure and we're gonna, 
we have a duty to tell our readers that you have AIDS. This is still debated, by the way, in journalism classes about, about the public versus private. And so he was furious, uh, but he went through it and made in the HBO building in New York, he made this very dramatic statement. Um, and uh, he was angry for a few weeks, for sure. But I think by the, by the end of his life, the following February, I think he realized that it was, as painful as it was, it was the best thing. He turned himself into a one-person AIDS awareness movement. He, he started a foundation. He was speaking three and four times a week, even though he was down to 128 pounds and weak and knew he didn't have a lot of time. Every, every ounce of his, his body was directed at trying to get through the hysteria all the kind of misunderstandings about, about AIDS in those days. So in September of, of 92, he, as I say, he's down to 128 pounds, six foot one, emaciated. His friend Randall Robinson, he grew up with him in Richmond. Uh, Randall Robinson was a great, uh, is still a great uh, uh, kind of social justice advocate in international relations and started an organization called Trans Africa with Arthur. In, in the 1970s, and uh, he got involved in representing the, the rights of refugees, Haitian refugees, who were being treated differently than the Cubans. Most people thought because of the, the color of their skin, it was pretty obvious, and so this is, this is the first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush. So they were gonna have a big rally in front of the White House to protest this, and they got 3,000 3, people to show up. But Randall called Arthur in New York and said, oh, it would be so great if you could be there. I know you're, I know you're sick, but um, it would mean so much. And Arthur's wife and his doctor said, you'd be crazy to go. You know, you, you may not survive it. Arthur says, I've gotta go, I've gotta go. So he goes down, he's the only professional athlete there out of the 3,000 people. Even though for years he had been advocating uh, for a athletes to speak out, to speak their mind on various various issues. And he's one of the hundred who's arrested. You know, they, there's a picture in my book of him being, you know, carted off and um, he posts bail, um, doesn't ask for any, any special favors, uh, goes back to New York the next day and has another heart attack. His, his doctor and his wife were correct. Didn't kill him, he lived for a few more weeks, but I think it speaks volume about the depth of his character, that he, he felt a personal responsibility that regardless of, of his disease, that he had, someone had to be there to represent uh, athletes, uh, you know, in a kind of compassionate, compassionate way. Uh, in 1985, he was arrested out in front of the South African Embassy protesting apartheid. Of course, this is, uh, you know, four or five years before Nelson Mandela was released from prison. So this is, you know, still classic apartheid. And he, at the time, he was the captain of the Davis Cup team from 1981 to 85. Uh, he, these were the great glory years. John McEnroe was his star player. Jimmy Connors played a little bit, um, not very much, but McEnroe was the star. Of course, he drove Arthur crazy. He was super brat in those days, always throwing his racket and screaming, and, and, uh, but playing great, passionate tennis. And uh, I went through the records in the Arthur Ashe papers in New York about this, and hundreds of letters saying, we're proud of you, Arthur, for leading the Davis Cup team to two victories in a row, but is it worth it if you do it with McEnroe? Why don't you make a statement? We've always known that you, you, you are the paragon of sportsmanship. It would, it would speak volumes if you would throw McEnroe off the team. And Arthur thought about it, and even some of Arthur's close friends, even his agent, Donald Dell, said, not a bad idea. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. I think in part because, uh, although McEnroe and Arthur Ashe were total opposites in terms of their behavior, there was a part of Arthur Ashe underneath that wanted to be like McEnroe. He said this in, in his book, Days of Grace, that written just before he died, that you know, he, he knew how controlled he was, how people thought he was so cool and calm and collected, but he also knew that he was kind of a raging torrent inside. Uh, he just didn't let it out in the way McEnroe did. And he, he thought, I would just give anything to be John McEnroe for 24 hours at Wimbledon, throwing my racket, 
swearing at the referees, being a total brat. Um, but I know I could never do it. I know I could never do it. Uh, it's just not who I am. Um, but it might have been healthy for him in the same way that we often see that Jackie Robinson's life was cut short in part because he had to hold it in. You may remember Branch Rickey um, of the Dodgers told him, okay, we're gonna desegregate Major League Baseball, but you, you can't fight back. You can't say a word, at least for the first two years. And later, of course, uh, uh, Robinson dies of, of diabetes and hypertension, but I think, and many of his closest friends feel that that, that shortened his life in a sense. And, and maybe it did Arthur's too. Um, but what he, what he loved about McEnroe was his fighting spirit. You know, that, that he, he wasn't like Connors. In fact, McEnroe gave me an interview, I think in part because he wanted to talk about Connors. He and Arthur shared a dislike for Connors. Uh, uh, Arthur's widow, Jeannie, told me, he said, you know, I, I can only remember him saying a negative thing about one person in our whole marriage, and it was, it was Connors. You know, he said he, they, he was like oil and water, uh, of course, you know, Arthur's greatest victory was over Connors in the 1975 Wimbledon, probably the biggest upset in Wimbledon history. Um, many people have forgotten, though, when they played and Arthur won this upset, Connors, the week before, had sued him for $3 million because he was the head of the Association of Tennis Professionals, and he had sent a letter criticizing Connors for being selfish, for not playing Davis Cup, for only going for the money, and not, not respecting the rights of his fellow professionals. And so Connors sued him for defamation of character. He, once he lost, he quite quietly went away. You know, he was a little embarrassed, and um, it was a pretty shocking thing when, when Arthur won that, that, that victory. In fact, um, you know, it's a tr traditional, for the, the, the singles, male singles champion and the female to dance the first dance at the Wimbledon Ball. So that year was Billie Jean King, uh, who, who uh, became a dear close friend of Arthur's. He, in fact, he, he, he said near the end of his life that he thought she was the most important American athlete of the 20th century. He really admired her for, for being uh, so forthright on so many, so many issues. And it's great now that the National Tennis Center today is the Billie Jean King Tennis Center, and the largest tennis venue in the world is Arthur Ashe Stadium. They're, they're sort of paired, and uh, he uh, was not always, I think, on the same wavelength as the Billie Jean. He, um, he was, like most of the pros, I think, kind of misogynist and, and sexist in his early years. Uh, it was kind of a boys club, and they didn't think that the women should get equal, equal prize money, and, but then in 1977, he married Jeannie Ash, who was a very committed feminist, and she didn't take long to set him right. <laughs> First thing you knew, he was uh, totally for uh, gender equity, and uh, he and Billie Jean became fast, uh, fast, uh, fast friends. Uh, but when I, when, Matt, when I interviewed McEnroe, uh, he was, again, talking about how, how much he admired Ash, even though they were so different, you know, and... Uh, and today even, uh, I mean, there's a tremendous legacy that Arthur left that almost all of the protégés, the younger black players, have all started their own foundations. There must be a dozen of them that were running inner city clinics all over the country, the National Junior Tennis League. I don't know if you have a chapter here in Little Rock, but there are almost 300 of them around the country, uh, 300,000 kids. Uh, who, were, who they used tennis as a way of getting kids in the door. And then they, they try to teach them character and education, respect for education, and they give them computers and all this kind of thing. And tennis is just the, the means to a, a broader end. Well, Arthur started that along with his roommate, Charlie Passarell, in 1969, you know, when he's 25 years old, he thought of that. And they're now, you know, it has an enormous influence around around the country. That's just one example of the many organizations that he helped to, helped to fund and to start. And uh, what's, what always struck me in, in sort of following him around the last nine years, he never said no. He could never say no, you know. He, he, should, have, he should have probably, but someone would ask him to fly out to Los Angeles to lead a clinic with these inner city kids. And even if he had a, three things to do the day before in New York, he, he'd go anyway. 
And uh, there are legendary stories about when he would get out uh, teaching kids uh, on the court, he, he would lose himself and he might have a six o'clock appointment and he'd be out there at 5.58, these kids, and making them feel like they were the most important people in the world. You know, and they'd have to drag him off the court. You know, and uh, um, so he's really a special, special person. I think uh, I worried about how to end the book. I wasn't sure how I would do it. I, I didn't, the, the AIDS story is so sad in his case. He'd only be 75 now. He's the same age as Joe Biden. You know, he'd still be in the thick of things. He died at 49. Like Alexander Hamilton, he never made it to age 50. Uh, in fact, I, I, I say I worked on the book for nine years, but it was only eight years. Because I took a year off. I, in the middle of it, both my parents died. Uh, I was getting older, feeling my own mortality. I'd already written eight books. I, I really was writing this book because I really wanted to, because I was committed about it, but I didn't need to write it. I'd, I'd killed enough trees, I guess, in my career. And, um, and I thought, I know how obsessed I'm going to have to be to finish this book, that I have to you know, the last thing I think of when I go to bed at night is Arthur Ashe, the first thing I think of when I wake up, and this story's not going to end well. The trajectory really bothered me, and I had to really think through it about whether I wanted to put myself and my family through this for five more years of hearing incessantly about Arthur Ashe. I think all my friends back in Florida are so happy that the book is out now, so I don't have to talk about it anymore, <laughs> uh, but um, to them. Um, I mean, I think they're very happy for me. Um, I actually, um, I play on a public courts. These are clay courts in St. Petersburg. And that's where he played his, his last amateur tournament in 1969 in March. It's where Chrissy Everett won her first tournament. So it's kind of historic, kind of a bridge between the black and white communities in uh, you know, very, very interracial and it's a very important place now. It has been for a long time. So Arthur's playing in 1969 in the tournament. And uh, he was already number one in the country. He'd already won the US Open. So the, the feature story in the program is on him. And uh, so in, halfway through the tournament, he wants to practice. And all the courts are being used. So there was a young, young boy, 14 years old, named Paul Riley, who's now very influential in the Tampa Bay area. He's the head of Raymond James. Okay, so he's a, and the whole family of Riley's, they're all six foot six and about 130 pounds, and they have, all have five children, boys are all, they all, it's, it's like the Stepford wives, they're all the same, you know. And anyway, Paul was an up and coming junior, and he was a ball boy, and he befriended Arthur, and Arthur needed a place to practice, and so he said, well, I, I know the pro over at Lakewood Country Club. I'm sure we can go over there and practice. It's all white. You know, it's restricted. There are no black members. No blacks ever played there before. But surely, they, they'll be honored to have you there. And, and then, sure enough, the pro was honored to have him there. So they got out on the court at, Lake, at the country club. Five minutes in, this racist golfer sees this black person on the tennis court and comes racing up in a golf cart, you know, screaming, get the end off the court. He has no idea that it's Arthur Ashe or anybody else. He doesn't care. And uh, this is not, it's important to realize this is 1969. This is five years after the Civil Rights Act, four years after the Voting Rights Act, that he's having to put up with this kind of thing. So Paul Riley, the, the kid, was so embarrassed that this was happening, he steps and he's ready to fight this racist dog, golfer. And, uh, but of course, Arthur classically steps in and says, oh, don't, that's silly. Uh, we'll just leave. You know, it's not worth it. Trust me, Paul, I've been here before. I've seen this happen. It's not worth uh, you getting in trouble or, or anybody uh, you know, resorting to violence or even loud shouting. And uh, so they leave. Uh, but I always thought, what a, what, a, what a kind of classic expression of his, his commitment to maybe to a higher order of things, that he always seemed to take the long view which didn't satisfy everybody. You know, so a lot of people, you, you need to vent, you want to get emotional, um, you think in short terms of, of responding, you know, getting back, and, and Arthur never seemed to fall into that somehow. Somehow he, he, he uh, and I'm not sure 
whether it was because he felt guilty about those early years when he wasn't involved and once he did get involved, he could never do enough really to, uh, to, make, to make up for it. Um, uh, but he, he, was, he, he liked to call himself near the end of his life, citizen of the world. He had a t-shirt that he wore all the time called Citizen of the World. And there's a wonderful documentary that was released in 1994 called Citizen of the World, just after he died. And, but you think about the tra trajectory of his life from this very narrow early life in the Jackson Ward section of Richmond. Uh, there, there was no conception that any young black boy could ever make a living at tennis or ever play against whites. I mean, what he was trying to do didn't exist at, at that point. You know, that, that he would be the first to get a scholarship to UCLA, the, one of the two best programs in the country, or that he would become an ambassador to the United Nations and he would, you know, go all over the world and, and had a kind of a jet setter lifestyle. You know, I mean, he, he enjoyed himself. And in fact, there have been, been, been dozens of reviews in newspapers all over the world. And my favorite one came the other day from the Daily Mail in London. I don't know if you're familiar, it's a real scandal sheet. You know, that's always has the pictures of the, of the half-naked birds, as they call them, in, in, in London. And uh, so there's this review written by a woman, and the headline is something like, Arthur Ashe romps with flight attendants from Trinidad to Sweden, and it had some other obvious sexual reference, and the whole, the whole, and I mean, there is stuff about his sex life, and it's, I, I, it's not a prurient, it's, it's part of his life, you know, and, uh, but um, um, this reviewer picked out every single piece in the book and uh, emphasized the sex in the book, and so I, I, I called my editor and I said, finally, somebody who knows how to sell books. <laughs> 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 so, anyway, but what, what I was going to say, in closing, um, that uh, he became one of the richest athletes in the world. He was the first black athlete to be accepted for endorsements. Um, so he had rackets, he made millions, uh, Catalina Sportswear. Uh, he was uh, appar apparently as popular among white consumers as black consumers. You know, he was kind of, a, even though he considered himself a race man, for sure, and, and uh, never tried to in any way hide his racial identity. And he opened it up for many other athletes as well. So he became wealthy and he could, could although he never, was never into possessions, you know. He once lost himself in Australia when he won the Australian Open in 1970. And on a whim, he bought a Rolls Royce. Um, and he had a ship back from Australia and he came back to the States. I don't think he ever drove it. He just felt so guilty, he sold it immediately. <laughs> so this is not me, what was I thinking, you know. Um, so he was never about fame and fortune. He was about the platform that celebrity gave him so that people would listen to him and that he could, he could get enough experience in his life you know, to, to make a difference. So I think if he were here today, he would really applaud what Colin Kaepernick and LeBron James and Stephon Curry have been doing and the way they've been doing it um, by not really raising their voices or becoming emotional. Um, but um, keeping their eye on the ball, so to speak, uh, taking a knee for social justice. I think that's what he, he, you know, he would have done it in his own way, you know, and sometimes he was called an Uncle Tom uh, because he wouldn't resort to emotionalism and, uh, and he didn't publicize a lot of what he did. He did it behind the scenes. Um, but uh, I, I, it's hard to imagine anybody doing more in 49 years, and I think he's left a remarkable, remarkable legacy. And when, uh, in that last story, I'll stop. October uh, 2016, uh, President Obama is in Greensboro, North Carolina, at North Carolina A&T, which is where the sit-ins began in 1960. And they had a, uh, a forum on race and activism, and, and uh, they started with a Maya Angelou, um, kind of an aphorism. Angelou once wrote, we can, we can suffer defeats, but we must not be defeated. Okay? We can suffer defeats, but we must not be defeated. 
And so that's, that was sort of the touchstone for the discussion. And, and one of the first questions was from a uh, young man named Sam Hunt, who was a, the star guard on the North Carolina A&T basketball team. And Sam Hunt said, Mr. President, this is the last week, week of course, before the election, he said, uh, I want to be an athlete, but I want to be an activist. How can I possibly combine these? Do you have any models for me? So without missing a beat, President Obama says, um, well, um, the two people that I admire most from the sports world are Muhammad Ali and Arthur Ashe. Two totally different figures in terms of their personality and maybe in some, some case some of their views, but both were transformational in the way that they stood up for the sort of the dignity of, of uh, not only of their race, but of humanity. And uh, uh, he talked about how these are the two people who taught, taught me what it meant to be a man. And uh, he, the, the description was very funny, and that's how I end the book. Uh, talked about Ali being sort of out there, you know, totally over the top, and then here's, uh, here's uh, Ash, who looked like a professor, and he, and he said that he even conjugated his verbs. Uh, I love that. Kind of a nerd, world-class athlete. Um, um, so he was, uh, the word unique is often overused, I think, but I think Ash was, in many ways, a, a unique figure. I think we could use him now. Um, certainly as part of the ongoing uh, debate. And I, I, um, I'm glad that I survived the nine years enough to get, see this between hard covers and uh, I hope if you get a chance to read it that you'll you'll enjoy it and and, and learn from it. Thank you. Do you have time for just a couple of quick questions? Uh, we'll start in the back. Hey, Raymond, thanks for being here. My name is Patrick. I handle marketing and communications. Uh, one of the things I was really surprised about whenever I was doing some research on this, uh, this speaker event was that um, Arthur Ashe was in the Army for a couple of years. Yes. Um, he was in the Army when he won the U.S. Open. Okay. He okay. was on leave. Yeah, and so do you have any you know, insight into what that experience was like for him? And was he, what were his attitudes like toward the war at that time? Well, he was sort of made to be a soldier, uh, not in the terms of the violence that you might have to if you were actually in warfare, but he was so organized, so efficient, he, was, he, he, was, uh, he looked like a soldier, right? He was a second lieutenant, and he was at West Point for the two years working in data processing, and then he, they'd let him go on leave all the time to play Davis Cup. And at the same time, his younger brother, Johnny, to whom he was very close, five years younger, was doing two terms in Vietnam in the Marines. And some of you may have seen, there's an ESPN 30 by 30, 30 for 30, called Johnny and Arthur. And Johnny thought that Arthur was gonna be sent to Vietnam. So he went to his commanding officer and said, look, I'll do another tour. I know you can't put two brothers in the same theater of operations. Now, in truth, Arthur never knew about this. He didn't tell Arthur, and it probably didn't make any difference. Or they were not gonna send Arthur to Vietnam. Um, but Johnny didn't know that, and it really, I think it speaks volumes about the, the, the closeness of the brothers. Uh, Johnny's still around, by the way. He's a remarkable, remarkable person who uh, was a master sergeant, you know, spent, spent over 20 years in the, in the Marine Corps, and uh, they disagreed about the war. It didn't, I don't think it affected their relationship, but Arthur, came to think that the war was really wrong, morally indefensible, and he actually said so when he was on a USO tour uh, with, uh, the, to the ambassador, the American ambassador, and to the, the head of the American forces who were kind of giving the propaganda line that we're winning, and Arthur said, well, that's not what I hear, and of course, uh, he was asking specifically about how the black troops were being treated and, and everything, so he was, that was one of, I think, his, his coming out, in a sense. And so, in a sort of ironic way, I think, being a soldier um, deepened his commitment to being a full citizen, and that's really what he wanted to do, active citizenship. I think that's why he cared so much about Davis Cup, that it was an affirmation that he was a full citizen. No African American had ever played Davis Cup before, and not only did he play Davis Cup, but he had the, the best record in the history of Davis Cup play in, in singles, and, and, and uh, even when he won, uh, 
after he, he won Wimbledon in 75, they said, this must be the greatest, most exciting thing that's ever happened to you. He said, well, you know, not really. Uh, I, I, it was greater when we won the Davis Cup in 1968, and I, when they would say, point USA, not point Ash. And I think he really meant it. You know, so in that sense, even though he was anti-war, he was extraordinarily patriotic in the sense of his kind of commitment to the values of his, of his nation. Yes, yes sir. Of the 200 pages that you did not include in the book, uh -huh. what, what issue among those pages was the most difficult for you to extract? You know, I didn't cut out any issue. Um, historians tend to be long-winded, you know. Um, my wife will tell you, right? Um, we, we can't even clear our throat in 10 minutes, right? Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, that's and witches and commas and uh, you know caveats and you know, clarifying uh, phrases and clauses that uh, I, I don't think really clarified anything. I mean, I think I really I was in denial at first. I mean, I spent nine years writing this. I don't want to touch it. I'd never been edited like that before in my other eight books, um, but I, I, I know that it improved the book. It, it really did, and. Uh, uh, I think it was it was the right thing to do, and my, my editor, who is a wonderful editor, uh, he does all of David, David McCullough's books, um, and uh, I think he's overseen seven or eight Pulitzer Prize winning books, so he knows what he's doing, and he he uh, he guided me through it, and uh, so I didn't I didn't I don't think I cut anything out. I wouldn't have done that actually. I I uh, I really. Um, I just, I just cut down the, the mode of expression, that's all. There was nothing that really was, was left out. Yes, ma'am. One second. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming. It was great. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, how did you fight the intimidation of writing about a subject that well-known and that well-written about? I mean, he was written about, too. He was, but this is the first book on our thrash. This is, this is the very first one, which is shocking. Uh, he, now, he wrote four autobiographies. I could not have written this book without that. So I, I, I saw him play twice. I never talked to him, never met him, couldn't interview him. But those four books, because he's such a truth teller, uh, and the first one was written when he was 23. And every 10 years, he'd write another autobiography. And uh, so you can see the progression of his ideas and his life and so much wonderful. And he was so articulate, you know, that uh, um, it, excuse me? There's, there's one um, very good documentary uh, that's called Citizen of the World that was done in 1994. And then there's a 60-minute version, uh, another documentary that's quite good. Not a full one, though. You know, it's not, you need at least a couple of hours. And uh, I've had a couple documentary filmmakers approach me in the last couple of weeks. And three Hollywood studios approach me about a feature film and it looks like one of the, it's looks like it's going to happen, which I'm I'm really happy about. Uh, not only for my grandson's college fund, <laughs> which is the most important thing, um, but um, well, the intimidating thing I think is that people who play tennis seriously love tennis. They live in the world of tennis, and. Um, they, and so they were sort of li lying in wait, you know, for you to make a mistake. Now, I played a lot of tennis. I'm a mediocre tennis player, but, but um, uh, there's a, to give you an example, last week I got a correspondence from Richard Evans. I quote in the book, he's a very well-known British tennis writer. He knew Arthur well. And apparently... He, 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 I haven't talked to him yet about this, but he, he was upset because I used the word volley when he said I should have used the word rally. Now, I don't know whether this is a Britishism or not, or whether he's right. Um, I mean, there are bigger fish to fry here. I'm not going to worry, lose too much sleep over it, but, but that's the kind of thing. Um, 
and a couple of people have pointed out mistakes. So I'm, I've got all this list of, of minor mistakes that they've already been changed in the ebook, and uh, they will be changed in, when the second printing comes out in a few weeks. I'll get, I'll get it all right. I'm, I, I have lost a little sleep over that. You know, they're, they're, in a book this long, there's always a typo or two, and and. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Yannick Noah, of course, was one of Ash's protégés, and Ash discovered him when he was 11 years old in Cameroon, and, and so I talk about later how they were great friends, and, and they were socializing during the French Open, and uh, 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 Noah had just opened a restaurant called Guignol in Manhattan, but I said Midtown Manhattan. It's actually Lower Manhattan. So I got this scathing letter. How could you make that mistake? <laughs> so there are things like that that you, uh, you know, are probably inevitable. But I, but I hope I got the important things right. And uh, you know, you can never do full justice to a life this complex. Uh, you just you know do your best. And um, but I, I did feel so committed to doing it because it early on became more than just a book to me. You know, it became something that I think that will be an empowering message for younger generations to, to learn about this person that, that uh, a lot of them don't know who he is, really. You know, they may have heard the name, but uh, anyway. Ray, thank you for spending nine years doing this and for coming and talking to us, and thank you oh, all for coming great. out. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>